Baptists, if you would, let's stand and let's worship together. salvation, one the way that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptist Church, tell them that you're glad to see me for worship with us online. We're glad that you are here as well. (laughs) 
And as we continue to worship, the kids can come on down from it. space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how the cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire all my dead left for dead beneath the water space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. Testament reading today comes from Numbers chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. 
yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, forgive the sins of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they have left Egypt until now. The New Testament reading comes from the book of Matthew, verse, chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Good morning, boys and girls. Wow, y'all are like way down there, aren't you? Now, I am not Mr. Wes. I think y'all know that, don't you? I'm Mr. Danny. A lot of you know me, and I know you. And uh, Mr. West was out of town last night and coming back this afternoon, but um, he's, he's been there. So we're going to be together here, and then um, we've got some other leaders who are going to take you downstairs in just a minute, okay? Now let me ask you a question. How many of you like cupcakes? Cupcakes, yeah, okay. Everybody's jumping off the carpet. I like cupcakes. Now several years ago, I was with a lot of our teenagers, and we were having a contest to see who could make the best cupcake. Now, one of the ways we figured out who could make the best cupcake is myself and somebody else got to taste them. And so this one group was coming up, and oh, it looked really good. It was chocolate. with I like a lot of chocolate. So a lot of chocolate icing, and they knew that. So they knew that if I saw this cupcake, I was going to get my hopes up. And so I took that cupcake... And I took a really big bite, and you know what? Inside that cupcake, it wasn't sweet and chocolatey. You know what it was? You know what it was? It was anchovies. <laughs> now, the adults know what anchovies are, so let me tell you. Anchovies are little fish that are really, really salty. And so all of a sudden, I went from being really happy about this cupcake to wondering if there was a garbage can somewhere I could throw it into. They had tricked me. Now, everybody laughed, and I laughed because it was all in good fun, right? But you know what? Today, you're going to be in kids' worship, and you're going to talk about a story where there's a group of people that come to Jesus, and they start asking him questions. And when they're asking him questions, it may sound like at first they really want to know the answer, but you know what? They're really trying to trick Jesus. They're trying to trick Jesus into giving an answer that will get him in trouble. But what you're going to find out is that Jesus is very, very wise, and he gave them an answer that they weren't expecting. So let's pray together, and then we'll go downstairs, okay? Father, we thank you that you love us, that you care for us. We thank you for the wisdom that you give us through Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's stand. Let's continue to worship together. Is the highest your name is the 
Father God, we thank you for this place and this church that we can come and praise your name and just celebrate you. I pray now that as we give our offerings and our gifts, that you would take those gifts and offerings and use them to spread light to the world and to further your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. It's good to see you all this morning. I'm glad you're here. And uh, we are supposed to have a picnic this afternoon uh, at 4 o'clock. Uh, we'll eat at 5 out at the uh, Camp Bays Mountain. Um, but as you know, we have some sporadic showers that have been popping up. And so what we're going to do is, uh, if we're going to change things, we will have it on the church website and on the Facebook page at 330 if not, we'll try to go on. Now, we're supposed to have swimming, and we're supposed to have uh, tower climbing. Those are weather permitting. So anyway, by 3.30, we'll have it on the... If, if, if the website doesn't say anything at 3.30, come on out. If it does, we'll tell you what's going on. Is that all right? Uh, if you're our guest, we're honored you're here, and we'd like to ask you to fill out a guest card that's in the pew rack ahead of you, and also... Uh, just to be a reminder, we have coffee and donuts over in our atrium before, uh, before we study the Bible together. If you don't have a place to study the Bible, let me know and we'll get that for you. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful that you are in this place and that we get to be with you. Allow us to treasure these moments of fellowship, of study, and of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Do any of you fancy yourselves as deal makers? Does anybody like to try to get a good deal on something? Anybody? Come on. Nobody besides me? I can't believe this. All right, thank you. I see some of your hands. I, there's just something about getting a good deal that, uh, even if it's not, it makes me feel good. You know what I mean? Uh, years and years ago, we went... In 1981, Penny and I were in California, and we went to, uh, we made the mistake of going to Tijuana. Uh, if you've done that, you know what I mean by the mistake of going there. And a friend of mine said, uh, you've got to go down there and you've got to bargain. You've got to bargain with the shop owners. Well, I wanted an Onyx chess set. And uh, 
I talked to a friend of mine. I said, what do I do? He said, he said they're going to give you some ridiculous price, and you offer a ridiculous price back. It's a game, and it's all fun. So this guy, this is 1981 now. For goodness sakes, it's a long time ago. And I go in, and the guy says, may I help you? And I have on, I was a Rotarian at that point. I have on a T-shirt that says Rotarian. He says, oh, Rotarian, me too. I said, I'm, I'm thinking, boy, this is going to be great. And, and he, I said, I want an Onyx chess set. He said, right over here, we have Onyx chess sets, every kind you want. I said, I like this one. How much do you want for it? He said, $50. Remember, it's 1981, $50. I said, $50? And I'm trying to play the game, you know. And he says, uh, what you give me for it? I said, I'll give you 10. And I'm thinking, this is the game, you know what I mean? He takes me by the arm literally takes me by the arm, walks me to the exit of the store. And he says, Mr., you'll buy nothing in Mexico. You're too cheap. <laughs> he did not know that that was something that did not shame me one bit. <laughs> I thought that was a great, I thought that was a great tribute. But, you know, there's something about making deals that, uh, if, you're, if you have Scottish ancestry like me, you, you just want to make a deal. You know, you want to get the best deal you can. Now, that's okay when you're buying something. Maybe you just enjoy bartering for things all the time. But what about when it comes to your religion? Do we ever want to make a deal with God? Well, the story today is from a little bitty book in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet about the same time as Amos and Isaiah and Micah. But Hosea has a, a different slant. Hosea, his story is uniquely sad. The Bible tells us that Hosea gets married. And we expect that to be a happy time, but Hosea marries a lady whose life symbolizes the life of God's people with God. Hosea marries her. Her name is wonderful. Her name is Gomer. Isn't that a great name? Gomer. And Gomer ends up not being faithful to Hosea. In fact, she never has a minute of fidelity. Every time he thinks things are going to be better, he takes her back, and then she falls back into that depravity. And the Bible tells us, if you read the whole book, it, it tells us that this is the pattern that God senses with his people that every time they come back. So let me set the stage for you. It is highly likely, most Old Testament scholars believe, that Gomer is what would be called a temple prostitute. Now, the false god that Israel is always tempted to follow is a god whose name is spelled B-A-A-L, Baal or Baal, Baal. Baal is a god of fertility who provides sun, S, sons, S-O-N-S, -O -O how you spell it, and rain and fertility and crops. And so with the climate over there where rain is not as prevalent as it is here, you're always looking for some hope of rain and crops. And it appears that Here's what they thought about Baal. I want you to listen to what their theology was. Baal was a god who reigned from the fall to the spring. God reigned from about what we would call September to about what we would call May. And then they believed, now get this, they believed that Baal was killed every May. All right? Baal gets killed every May by his adversary, a god named Mott. M-O-T, Mot. And the way Baal is brought back to life is by these temple prostitutes. 
Now, that's a warped theology if I've ever heard one. But that's what they believed. And you see, it seems like Israel and Judah, the twin nations here, can always, every time, they're trying to get back in Baal's good graces. And as stupid as that theology seems, any time it got dry, they got back to worshiping Baal. Now, I got to tell you, the book of Hosea, if you sit down for an afternoon of reading, is pretty depressing. The the names of the children in chapter 1 are horrendous. Not my people, one of their names. It's reminding the people of God that they have done every, they have sold their souls, if you will, for a, a better deal. Now, I want you to listen to this one thing. Hosea's name means salvation. It's very close to the name Yeshua, which is how we call Jesus, all right? His name is salvation, but his life, his life is filled with sadness. And what he tells people is that God also is sad because his people keep running after Baal. Now, I want you to look with me near the end of the book. We're going to look at chapter 14. So what we've seen for 13 chapters is sadness and the punishment that comes from that infidelity to God. But here is the hope that comes at the end of the prophecy. I want you to look with me. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely. This is God after after the people have strayed and strayed and strayed and strayed and strayed and strayed and strayed. I will heal their waywardness and love for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. Now I hope you get that metaphor. It's moisture. That's what they need. I'll be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily, like a cedar of Lebanon. He will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like a cedar of Lebanon. That's a beautiful tree. People will dwell again in his shade. They will flourish like the grain. They will blossom like the vine. Israel's fame will be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim, what more have I to do with idols? I will answer him and care for him. I'm a flourishing juniper. Your fruitfulness comes from me. I want you to hear what he's saying. Those of you who have been chasing after prosperity, precipitation, I'm the one that really provides it. Why in the world does God... Why in the world does God give chance after chance after chance after chance? I want to give you three reasons that I believe that's what God does. The first one is that the Bible tells us from beginnings to end that God wants a relationship with you and me. All right? God desires us to be in a relationship. And Jesus uses a metaphor when he is uh, attacked for hanging around people who are not the upper crust of society. Jesus uses a metaphor. I I have come to those who are sick. I've come to be a doctor. And they're thinking, well, we really don't want that. We don't want that. We want to judge. Now, i got to tell you a funny story. A long time ago, uh, Carson Newman College, of which I was a trustee, decided to give Dolly Parton an honorary doctorate. Now, we're all for that, aren't we? UT did it a few years later. Carson Newman beat him to it. But uh, I was a pastor in Dolly's home county. Now, I'm, I'm a second-year trustee. That means you sit there and you shut up and you don't say anything. But, I mean, what chances am I going to have to be near Dolly Parton? You know what I mean? So I called the president and I said, look, I'll never ask for anything ever again. But I'm the county pastor. Now, you've got to get this picture. I'm sitting on a stage next to Dolly Parton. And my wife is six months pregnant in 85 degree heat. Let's just say there's a little tension on the way over there and on the way back, all right? 
But I'm sitting next to Dolly, and she gets her doctorate, and we're walking out in an academic procession. Oh, you know how, how wonderful those things are. You got on robes, and it's hot and all that. And we're all the way out, and she has those stiletto heels on, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, she's going to fall, and I'm going to fall, and it's going to be awful. And she, in true Dolly fashion, people are around her taking pictures. This is like 1985, a long time ago. People, and she looks up, and, and everybody's got all their formality, you know. And she looks up at this crowd. She says, anybody need a doctor? <laughs> well, I thought that was great. Then we go over and we're getting pictures taken in this guest house. And, and our president at that time, Dr. Maddox, was very uptight, just so uptight. He was, he was a, kind of a shy guy. And he's having to sit next to Dolly Parton and get all these pictures taken. And they're sitting on this couch. And he's like this. And she looks at him and she says, if you don't loosen up, I'm going to have to play doctor on you. <laughs> now, I want to tell you that his wife's blood pressure went through the roof. <laughs> Needed a doctor? Well, you know, you could probably do worse. Jesus says, I came to people who need a doctor, not people who are in perfect spiritual health. I want you to see that because I think that's tremendously important. For us as we try to reach people beyond our walls. The second thing I want you to see is this. That God's mercy is bigger than anybody's sins. Okay? Gomer. Not once, not twice, but thrice that we know of. Leaves Hosea and goes back to the ways of the dark side. I used to see a sign here in East Tennessee. It was one of those billboards. They put this sign up. They left it a long time. It said, home is where the place where they always have to take you in. You know, I would substitute church. I wouldn't put have. Church is the place they will always take you in. And the third thing I want you to see is along that same line, it's a it's a little saying I saw years ago, and it's spoken to me a long time. The church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Isn't that good? The church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And you see, that's what Jesus' contemporaries could not understand. They thought religion was where you showed off. Showed off your legalism, your uprightness. Jesus said, no, no, no. That's not what it's about at all. It's where you come to get grace and mercy and forgiveness. Well, tomorrow is the 18th birthday of one of our most wonderful ministries, Celebrate Recovery. 18 years we've been ministering to people who have hurts, hang-ups, and habits. And I want you to watch and learn, if you don't know, just a little bit about CR. One of the ways our church has reached out to people who are hurting, who have hurts, hang-ups, and habits, both within our congregation and outside our church fellowship is Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery actually turns 18 years old tomorrow on September 11th. David and Susan Lane have been leading Celebrate Recovery for several years, and I want you to hear from them about the impact Celebrate Recovery is having on First Baptist and people who are beyond the walls of First Baptist. So Susan, David, tell us about CR. Well, Celebrate Recovery is a biblically-based 12-step recovery program. And oftentimes people think, first thing, of drugs and alcohol. But Celebrate Recovery is so much more. 
You know, from our personal experience, we had a son that was a drug addict. We came to recovery to try to get help with that situation at home, and it completely changed our lives. <clears throat> But Celebrate Recovery is for any hurt, habit, hang up. We have people with food struggles. We have people that are struggling with being adults of alcoholic families and the things that they went through when they were a child. We have people that are in grief and just life hurts. But over the 18 years, we've seen a lot of success stories. Yes, there's been countless people that have been helped through this program. And right now, there are people that are just hurting from all aspects of life and we continue to help people across the board and people go on to live a normal life just based on what the, the principles of this program and we have people that come back month after after month just asking for help and just asking for us to help reach out to other people make calls and just to minister to people that are hurting so when when and where does CR meet we meet every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at 441 Clay Street. And we have a large group time that is about 30 minutes long, and then we go into small groups. And that lasts, we usually get out about 7.30 or quarter to eight. So if you, if somebody watching uh, knows somebody who needs the ministry of Celebrate Recovery, how do they go about getting involved? Well, you can contact us directly, Susan or I. Or you can call the church office at 247-4122. Uh, you can speak to one of the office workers, or you can ask for the extension, 250. That will so, ring directly to us. Uh, or you can just show up on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you. One of the immediate needs is for prayer team members or people that will just come and support the program just to be greeters, just to welcome people, and just to help out in various ways. We'd love to have you. So that's what CR is doing and has done now for 18 years. It's an incredible part of the ministry of First Baptist. It's one of those places where we can touch lives who might not think they were even considered worthy of a church. And I'm glad we're that kind of church. Thanks, David and Susan, for all you're doing. And we're going to be praying for Celebrate Recovery for many, many more years to come. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to First Baptist Church for supporting this ministry. Thank you. So I read an article this week. Uh, Dr. Bertha Madras, M-A-D-R-A-S, professor of psychobiology. I didn't know there were such people. Professor of psychobiology at Harvard Medical School. And here's what she said. One of the missing components of recovery programs, I want you to hear this closely, one of the missing components of recovery programs is spiritual engagement. And that's what we offer, not just at CR, but throughout our church. So, if you know somebody, if you know somebody that's far from God, if you know somebody that feels like God could never care for them, never love them, never want them, tell them this is the place where they're welcome and where they'll be received with love and mercy and grace. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so very much for loving us, whether we're having good days or bad days, even when we've strayed. Help us to feel your compassion and your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. This might be a day that you would confess your faith in Christ, or maybe it's a day you'd unite with us here at First Baptist. If so, as we stand and sing, I'll be here at the front. We'd be glad to share your decision with our congregation. Let's stand together.
coming up, so make sure to check your bulletins and, web, and the website. Please pray with me. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to come together to praise you, uh, to sing, uh, sing your glory, to sing your honor. God, thank you for your word that encourages us, and God, that calls us to, to step out in your mercy and grace, uh, to open our, our hearts, our arms, our church to others who, who need you just as we have. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,